So welcome to today's virtual seminar hosted by NM Law with our speaker, Stefan O'Grady. Today's virtual seminar is entitled Conservatorships. What are they and what can we learn from Britney Spears? Did you know that the number of conservatorships in the United States is not tracked and finding reliable data about conservatorships on a state-by-state -state basis is sporadic at best? In a 2018 report, the National Center for State Courts said that data standards for what needs to be collected and, report and reported often do not exist within a state. And in another report, it was estimated that there are about 1.3 million adult guardianship or conservatorship cases in the US that totaled at least $50 billion in assets. The recent news coverage regarding Britney Spears' ongoing legal battle to remove her father as conservator of her person has led to whistleblowers coming forward with disturbing information, highlighting the very dark side of conservatorship exploitation and conservatee abuse. The Government Accountability Office said in the report that the research did not identify any public, private, or non-governmental organization that systematically tracks the total number of guardianships or allegations of abuse, neglect, or, and exploitation by guardians. With no oversight, how do you go about ensuring that conservatorship abuse doesn't happen in your family? In this 45-minute uh, webinar, Stefan O'Grady will discuss how conservatorships can be used to safeguard an individual's personal and financial health and how they can unfortunately be perverted to abuse conservatees. And with that, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Stefan O'Grady. Stefan O'Grady is a senior litigation counsel to NM Law where his practice focuses on probate and trust litigation. Stefan represents beneficiaries and fiduciaries, both professional and non-professional, in contested and non-contested probate, trust, conservatorship, and guardianship matters. Stefan is a past president and member of the Board of Governors of the Century City Bar Association, a member of the Trust and Estate Section of the Los Angeles County, the Beverly Hills Bar, and the Orange County Bar Association, as well as the State Bar of California. Stefan is a graduate of the University of San Diego School of Law and holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of San Diego School of Business Administration. And in his free time, Stefan enjoys staying active and spending time with his wife and his corgi, Harry. Stefan is a passionate soccer fan and you can often find him at the LA Galaxy home games during the season. And with that, Stefan, I'm gonna go ahead and give you remote control so you can kick us off. Great, thank you, Jody. Well, welcome everyone. I, I wanted to talk on conservatorships because it's become a bit of a hot topic recently because of Britney Spears. Um, and while I have never had a client as quite as hope, high profile as Britney Spears or represented a conservator of a conservatee as such a, you know, of such a high profile individual. Uh, I've been involved in this area of law for a significant period of time and I've, I've come to appreciate the benefits of conservatorships and also how they can be perverted. Um, and I believe I have in my career witnessed um, aspects of conservatorship law, which have made my stomach turn. Um, so I want to, I, I just, I wanted to discuss it because, you know, frequently when people ask me, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm an attorney, um, you know, what kind of area of law do you practice? I do probate and trusts and, and encompassed in that as conservatorships, you know, a year ago, it might have been, well, what's a conservatorship? Now it's, oh my God, what do you know about Britney Spears? So I, I, it's, it's a useful area of law um you know because we never know when we might need a conservatorship for a loved one or you know in the event we need one ourselves so i'm going to structure this webinar um 
in twofold. The first will just be, I'm going to introduce to you what exactly is a conservatorship, you know, what the various types of conservatorships are, the proof necessary to obtain a conservatorship, uh, the rights that a conservatee loses and keeps when they're conserved, and then we'll open it up to what, what can we learn from Britney Spears? And that's gonna be much more of an interactive um, portion of this webinar. I know that we've all, well, I've seen a couple of the documentaries and read a couple of the articles. Um, and a lot of people have seen them and that's where a lot of the questions come from because, you know, from my point of view, the, these documentaries kind of paint the conservatorship system as the tool of the devil. And I don't find it to be that way, I'm not practicing in this area. I know that Judge Brenda Penny, who is Britney Spears judge, gets a lot of slack on um, social media and, and in the mainstream media. And uh, I practiced before Judge Brenda Penny since she was a commissioner uh, for years. Um, and she's a, a very well respected and a very good judge so you know i want to you know i want to kind of just if we can parse out what what should be believed what shouldn't be believed and what we can take from britney spears so let's get started um so let me see if i have control over there we go so that's me uh well so what is a conservatorship uh, well it's a court proceeding that is meant to protect a person who cannot care for their own person or property. And if, for example, um, we could use uh, the most common example of a conservatorship that I see, uh, someone will come to me and say, you know, my, my mother or my father is suffering from dementia. They, they can no longer make decisions for themselves. Uh, you know, they're neglecting their health. They're, their finances are a mess and I, I need to be able to step in and I need to be able to take care of them. And that is a majority of the conservatorships that I see. So uh, an individual that is interested in, in seeking a conservatorship will file a petition with the probate court. Um, and the petition is going to ask the court to appoint a conservator. It could be the child or they could want to appoint someone else. They could want to appoint a professional and that person will assuming that the court views the need um, will be appointed as a conservator and they will make uh, decisions for the conservatives best interests so well when is a conservatorship necessary well a conservatorship is necessary when there are no less restrictive alternatives available to provide for proposed conservatives personal and financial well-being. So well, what's the less restrictive alternative? I'll just bring all of these up. So generally, when you come to a firm like mine, where we have an estate planner like Noel, who is the firm owner, she will prepare a trust and a pour over will and various other documents, including a power of attorney, uh, in California, there's specific statutes on that. It, uh, generally, for financial matters, it's a uniform statutory form power of attorney, uh, which allows their agent, the agent nominated under that power of attorney, to make financial decisions uh, for their principal when they're incapacitated. And for financial, that's for financial, for health care decisions, there's advanced health care directives. Uh, for healthcare decisions, or there's a power of attorney for healthcare. Now that allows an agent to make a healthcare decision um, for the principal when the principal is no longer able to make those decisions for themselves. And then there are trusts. Um, so ideally, they they will work these different uh, mechanisms that are available to individuals when they're doing their estate planning um, that would hopefully prevent the need for a conservatorship ever to be necessary. Um, for example, in a uniform statutory reform power of attorney, you will nominate your uh, agent to make these decisions for you when you are no longer able to make them for yourself. And you will generally also nominate in your power of attorney or your advanced health care directive 
who you would want to be your conservator in the event one was necessary in the future. So ideally, if we have these types of powers of attorney in place, should a loved one of yours become incapacitated for any reason, no longer able to make these decisions, the person nominated in the power of attorneys would make these decisions for the incapacitated individual. Um, that would, in an ideal scenario, prevent the need to even go to a court and seek to have a conservatorship established. Uh, I would say 99% of my conservatorship cases where I am representing a petitioner who wants to bring a petition to a court to have themselves appointed as the conservator of, uh, over a loved one is because the loved one didn't plan accordingly and may have a will or may have a trust, but never uh, prepared powers of attorney. And when powers of attorney don't exist and someone becomes unable to make decisions for themselves, they're really the only option you have here in California is to seek to be appointed as a conservator. Because once a person is deemed incapacitated, and generally here the standard is by two physicians, uh, once that incapacity is determined, then that person is no longer able to enter into uh, agreements such as powers of attorney or advanced healthcare directives. So, and I have here also on the list trusts. You know, you can establish a trust, and the, uh, the the great thing about a trust is that you'll fund your property to that trust, your real your real property assets and your personal assets, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, and those types of things. And should you become incapacitated for any reason, uh, assuming you create a standard revocable trust, uh, you are the uh, first uh, trustee of that trust, you will nominate a successor trustee in the event you are incapacitated. Um, then that successor trustee will be able to access all of the accounts that you have funded to your trust, and we'll be able to make decisions accordingly. Again, where we run into issues are if you don't have a trust um, and you become incapacitated, and again, you don't have these other types of provisions in place, then it will be necessary to file a conservatorship petition. Um, so it's great to have these things in place, um, these powers of attorney and trusts. They have weaknesses, however, and so even oops, so even if someone has them in place, uh, it still may be necessary to uh, appoint a conservator. Uh, one of the main things that I see, uh, and which causes a lot of individuals concern, including the courts, is that agents under a power of attorney are required to account. So if my mother, for example, was to Name me as the agent under her power of attorney for financial decisions, um, and she becomes incapacitated, and I gain control of her bank accounts. There's really nothing to stop me from using that money for whatever purposes I deem fit. And obviously, I have a fiduciary duty to my mother to make sure that I'm using the monies for the appropriate reasons, but who's checking on me? No one's checking on me. Conservatorship is different. When a conservator is appointed, that is, a, and I will get to the different types of conservatorships, but they're the conservatorship of the estate where you're making financial decisions for someone. Uh, once appointed, you will be required to account to the court for all financial transactions made for the conservatorship estate one year after your appointment, and then every two years after that. Uh, and it can be more frequent if the court uh, requires it. So there is oversight. And that is one of the primary benefits to a conservatorship, in my opinion, is that you have court oversight, which you won't have if you are making decisions under a power of attorney. Uh, another instance, and I have a conservatorship right now, the sole reason that the children have sought to be appointed as co-conservators of their mother is because the financial institutions are refusing to honor the power of attorney or the financial institution wants to send it out to their legal department to be reviewed before they will make decisions. Um, as, as the slide indicates, this is also common for hospitals. Hospitals and healthcare providers 
will sometimes refuse to um, acknowledge a power of attorney for, for healthcare decisions or an advanced healthcare directive until it's reviewed by uh, their counsel. Well, the obvious result in that is that it could be too late once the review has taken place, the care needed by the patient has already passed, and uh, you know it, either they suffer ill effects or perhaps they pass away. So there are certainly weaknesses to uh, powers of attorney that can be solved by a conservatorship. So what are the two types of conservatorships? Uh, I deal with two types of conservatorships in my practice, and both of them are under the probate code, probate code section 1800.3. Uh, there is a third type of conservatorship, a mental health conservatorship, which is referred to as an LPS conservatorship, and that's under the Welfare and Institutions Code. I don't practice those types of conservatorships, and there's very specific reasons why. I will discuss what an LPS conservatorship is uh, towards the end of this discussion, but I want to focus on the two types of conservatorships under the probate code, which are the most common in California and which are the, the ones that I have a particular expertise in. So the first is a conservatorship of the person and the second is a conservatorship of the estate. You don't need to file a petition to be the conservator of, of both. You can petition to be the conservator of one or the other, um, or both. And so what is a conservatorship of the person? So that's governed by probate code section 1801. And a conservatorship of the person uh, is, a is a conservator who manages the personal care of a person who can no longer properly provide for his or her personal needs regarding that person's physical health. Generally, as I said, uh, many of my clients who want a petition to be conservators are children of senior adults or seniors who uh, not only are suffering because of advancing in age, but are suffering from the maladies, mental and physical maladies that come along with um, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, you know, anyone can suffer from those, but generally we do tend to see them more in seniors. You know, and seniors that are suffering from dementia, um, you know, have days where they're perfectly lucid and days when they're not. And on those days when they're not, they may forget to bathe. Um, they, they may not eat. They don't take care of their personal hygiene. They don't change their clothes. They neglect their dental care. They don't go to the doctor anymore. And if these types of circumstances exist where this individual does not have a power of attorney in place for someone to make these types of decisions for them, then oftentimes it's necessary to bring a petition to be the conservator of a person's person, which again is focusing on that person's physical health and making decisions for them. It would allow, you know, it allows the conservator of the person to make doctor's appointments, to decide where a person is going to live. Perhaps their residence, their primary residence is no longer appropriate for them. It's, it's too dangerous. They live alone. Um, they may wish to place them in a uh, assisted living facility. A conservatorship of the person will allow them to do that. It will allow you to hire caregivers uh, to bring into the home to take care of an incapacitated person. Um, you can hire nurses uh, to create healthcare, uh, home healthcare plans for the conserved individual. So, you know, the the abilities and the authority provided to a conservator of the person are um, very wide, very broad powers. Um, it is in California, interestingly enough, it's a rebuttable presumption. Even if I filed a petition for a conservatorship on behalf of a client to be the conservator of the person of their mother or father, uh, I would have to rebut the presumption in California that that individual has the capacity to make healthcare decisions for themselves. I would need to show the court by clear and convincing evidence, and I'll get to that standard a little bit later, 
um, that that person is no longer able to make those types of decisions for themselves. And so what's the next type of probate conservatorship? That's a conservatorship of the estate. So a conservatorship of the estate is the flip side of the personal health, it's financial matters. So a conservator of the estate may be appointed for a person who's substantially unable to manage his or her own financial resources or to resist fraud or undue influence. That the latter portion of that text is something I see very frequently. Uh, seniors get old and they become less able to resist fraud or undue influence. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I will have a client who lives out of state who will call me and they will say to me, you know, my mom's 85, she's, she's suffering from dementia, she's doing okay, but I'm concerned because a neighbor keeps coming over to her and I've been checking my mom's bank statements and it looks like mom's been giving money to this person. So there's a very real concern here that someone's taking advantage of mom. Well, if you become a, if you petition the court and are appointed as conservator of state, you'll be able to stop that in its tracks. You know, you will take control of mom's bank accounts, her brokerage accounts, her abilities to make withdrawals from those accounts, her ability to make trades if they're brokerage accounts. You know, you you essentially will step into mom's shoes and you will make these decisions for mom. Um, it is very useful way to aid in stopping potential fraud and undue influence. Um, you know, it's it's, but it's not the only reason. You know, mom may be forgetting to pay her bills. She may, you know, I find with seniors sometimes that they don't set up auto pay. They like to write the checks every month. Um, my mom, my mom likes to do that. Um, well, if you're getting older and you're getting more forgetful or you know if you're suffering from dementia or have been diagnosed with some sort of um, mental incapacity uh, you may forget to pay your bills and you may forget to pay your mortgage uh, and I I have seen situations where children find that their parents home is in foreclosure because mom or dad has forgotten to pay the mortgage for several months on the trot and we come to realize that mom's suffering from dementia and, and um, you know, the child is unable to assist because there's no power of attorney in place. So they're required, um, you know, for the sake of circumstances to file a petition for conservatorship of the estate so that they'd be able to step in and assist in making these types of financial decisions for, for their parents. Um, you know, it's, you know, it, it's a sad thing when someone gets to the point where they can't balance a checkbook anymore, or they're um, overspending money, um, or giving money away. And um, you know, the conservatorship of the estate is a very useful tool to be able to prevent someone from spending themselves into bankruptcy. So what's the evidentiary standard to successfully petition for a conservatorship, the person or the estate in California? It's clear and convincing evidence. Uh, for those of you that aren't lawyers, there are different evidentiary standards we have here in California. Um, in the criminal case, it's, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, there, there can, there can, if there's any, if there's either a slither of doubt, you can't convict. Uh, in civil cases, it's, it's preponderance of the evidence. The easiest way to, to think about that is uh, a scale. And if it moves slightly one side or the other, then you either have met your burden or you have not. So if something is more likely than not to be true, then that's preponderance of the evidence. Clear and convincing evidence is a more restrict standard. It's you have to prove to the court that it's highly probable that a fact is true. And why is it that we have to prove to the court that it's more probable than not that someone needs to be conserved? Well, I'm sure you've experienced, if you've seen any type of 
documentaries on conservatorships, the Britney Spears documentaries. There's a there's a very um, disturbing movie on Netflix right now called I Care a Lot. Now it it takes a lot of artistic license with professional fiduciaries and conservatorships, guardianships. But you know the one thing you learn from all of those types of that media is that conservatorships significantly curtail a conservatee's rights. Um, and the responsibility to make the financial and personal care decisions for a conserved person shifts to the conservator. And they are acting in a, then they are acting in capacity as the conservatee's fiduciary, which is the highest relationship uh, under the law here in California as a fiduciary relationship. So what types of rights do I lose if I'm conserved? Um, more so, um, people are more concerned with, well, what types of rights am I going to lose if a conservatorship of the estate is established? Well, if a conservatorship of the estate is established, the conservatee is presumed, unless you can rebut the presumption, they are presumed to lack the capacity to enter into contracts, to sell anything, to transfer property, to convey their property, to make gifts, to incur debts, to delegate powers, uh, to waive any rights under the law. So that's probate code section 1870 through 1876. Um, as an example, if someone is conserved and they have not created a trust, then because they are conserved, they're deemed to have lacked, they're deemed to lack the capacity to create a trust. And uh, because the testamentary capacity necessary to create a trust is equivalent to uh, that required to contract. So someone that's conserved no longer has the ability to contract. So what then can you do in that situation? I can bring what's called a petition for substituted judgment on behalf of the conservator to the court. Essentially, it's not substituting the conservator's judgment for the conservatee, but the court's judgment for the conservatee. So as long as there is evidence of a conservatee's testamentary intent, it could be based on a prior will or you know, their heirs are known, their heirs of law. Um, you know, I can bring a petition and I can, uh, I can uh, I'll get a court order which would allow my client uh, to prepare a trust uh, which will need to be approved by the court on, on behalf of the conservatee. The same uh, petitions for substituted judgment are very useful um, in making gifts. I have, I had a client in the past whose father was conserved and that um, individual did not have uh, an estate plan. And he had a regular pattern and practice of making certain charitable gifts every year um, and making gifts to his children. And once he was conserved, he can no longer make those gifts because he's deemed incapacitated pursuant to the probate code and unable to make these gifts. I can bring a petition for substituted judgment and evidence to the court that, well, this individual has a pattern and practice over the course of many years of making charitable gifts to his church, um, paying for his daughter's health insurance premiums, um, making his daughter's car payment, um, you know, this particular individual lived in California. He had children that lived out of state. He had a habit every year of paying for these children to come to visit him with his grandchildren. Um, you know, if there's a history of that, I can take that to the court and the court will substitute its judgment for the conservatee and um, allow those gifts to continue. You know, obviously, you know, you don't want someone that is the subject of a conservatorship who has been deemed in unable to make decisions for themselves to be conveying property. 
because then you run into what we discussed in the last slide is there's a fear of undue influence and that anyone might be able to come into that house, establish a relationship with that individual and convince them to transfer ownership of their home to that to the to the bad bad actor. Uh, conservatorship of the estate prevents that. You, 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 when you're conserved, you lose that right. Um, but so what types of rights do I lose if I am conserved under a conservatorship of the person? Well, a conservator of the person has the care, custody, and control of the conservatee. So you're going to be determining where that person lives, um, how they're educated. Um, if you are given the authority by the court, you can restrict their rights to receive visitors, telephone calls, to access their personal mail. Again, these, these, are, these must be specifically limited by the court. You know, if you are, if you have a conservatorship of the person, you are deemed to still have the capacity to vote unless the court finds you don't have that ability. You are deemed to have the capacity to marry unless the court finds that you don't have that capacity. You are deemed to still have the capacity to make a will, not a trust, but you can make a will unless of course the court finds uh, that you don't have the capacity to do so. So, I have a situation right now where I represent an individual who is conserved and her conservator has made a decision that she should not receive telephone calls and visits from certain individuals based on a belief that those individuals are intent on doing the conservative harm. Unless um, the court orders that that happen, um, I'm not sure that this conservator has the right to make those types of decisions and it's something that's being litigated right now. Um, but if they can prove to the court that contact with these individuals uh, telephone calls with these individuals, emailing with these individuals, receiving mail from these individuals is detrimental to the conservative, then the court can order that those stop. So it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a big deal to be able to lose your ability to see who you want to see, when you want to see them. You know, conservators I have seen in the past, conservators who have restricted visits from children because they believe that the children uh, have intentions not so noble when it comes to their parents. The parent may not understand that, may be desperate to see their children. But if the court rules that they are not able to because it is not in their best interests, then they won't be able to see their children. So you give up, a, an individual gives up a significant amount of their personal freedoms once a conservatorship of their person is established. Again, I mentioned this on the um, prior slide. Um, one thing a conservative does not give up is they are presumed to have the capacity to make medical decisions um, under probate code 2354, but that presumption is rebuttable. And in my experience in practicing this area of law, um, generally I wouldn't be bringing petitions on behalf of clients to make medical decisions for uh, an elderly parent or uh, an incapacitated person, unless I was going to be able to rebut that presumption. You know, if if someone is able to make medical care decisions for themselves, generally it's not it's not necessary yet to bring a petition to have that person conserved. So, what do I do if I file a petition for uh, conservatorship over my mother and? The court sets the hearing, and I filed that today, and the court sets the hearing in March of 2022. You know, I have very real concerns now that my mother may be the subject of undue influence. She can't make medical decisions for herself. She can't, she's not taking care of herself. She won't feed herself. She won't take care of her hygiene. She's wearing soiled clothing. She's becoming a hoarder. You know, am I, am I stuck? Do I, can I, do I have no power until I can have my case heard in March of 2022? 
22? No. There's this thing called a temporary conservatorship. You can bring it on an ex party basis, or you can bring it on five days notice, notice. And that allows an individual to petition for immediate intervention to ensure a proposed conservatee's well being and to secure their estate pending the hearing on the petition for the appointment of a general conservator. I, I, I'm racking my brain, but as I see here today, I cannot think of a circumstance in which I have filed a petition for the appointment of a general probate conservator without simultaneously filing a petition for a temporary conservatorship. Because once you've gotten to the point where someone comes to me, the urgency is great. The um, person that needs to be conserved needs the assistance immediately. And generally, there is no disagreement on that. And I, I'm tr I, I, again, I, I've never encountered uh, a circumstance in which the court has denied a petition I have brought for temporary conservatorships so that we can immediately um, start to take care of this individual. Um, you know, what's the grounds for the appointment of a temporary conservatorship? Again, the proposed conservatee likely requires a medical, immediate medical attention that can't wait. And if there's not a power of attorney for healthcare decisions in place, the court is going to grant that um, petition for temporary conservatorship so that the medical attention can be brought. Um, avoid losses of property. As I said uh, previously, uh, in my practice, I have experienced um, situations in which uh, an incapacitated senior parent has not made mortgage payments for months and months, and there are foreclosure proceedings. Um, you know, you can file a petition for temporary conservatorship uh, to allow the conservator to uh, a temporary conservator to be appointed immediately to stop the foreclosure proceedings. Um, and again, as we've said, as I pointed out previously, you know, concerns of undue influence, you can stop as you know, stop theft or conversion of a proposed conservatee's property uh, immediately. You don't have to wait for the hearing on the formal petition. Um, again, as I said, to protect the conservatee from undue influence, to pursue or respond to litigation. I represented a woman who wanted to be appointed petition, uh, wanted me to petition uh, to be appointed as a conservator of her father's estate because this gentleman was had a pretty robust real property business and owned approximately 800 real properties here in California and Texas. And um, because he was suffering dementia, um, he wasn't taking care of the properties um, and they were subject to a number of lawsuits that we had to have my client appointed as temporary conservator of the estate immediately on an ex party basis, which is an emergency petition, so that she could begin to respond to these various litigations. And as I said previously, um, if the proposed conservatee is ill and is not anticipated that they will last for a significant period of time, uh, we can have a temporary conservator appointed um, to be able to then petition the court for substituted judgment to be able to create a trust or modify an estate plan or, or make any contracts necessary um, before, you know, the, because that person's no longer able to do those types of uh, things for themselves. So, this is one of the questions that I get a lot, and we'll we'll talk about this a little bit more when we explore Britney Spears. Is and if you watch that movie, I care a lot on Netflix, you're going to think that a, a proposed conservatee has no protection. Uh, in that movie, I care a lot. It was a scam between a professional fiduciary and their doctor, and they would pick these very wealthy seniors, and the doctor would file a, a declaration with the court that this person was suffering from dementia and on an emergency petition, this professional fiduciary would walk into court and obtain a guardianship or conservatorship over an individual's person. Well, that, that doesn't happen. 
um, and there are protections in place to prevent that from happening. In LA County, for example, there is a panel of attorneys uh, that are called court, court appointed, they're on the court appointed counsel panel. And once someone files a petition to have someone conserved, the court will assign the conservatee, the proposed conservatee court appointed counsel. In Orange County, they, um, they, uh, it's not a court appointed counsel panel, it's an assistant uh, public defender. They will go out, they will interview the proposed conservatee, and they will determine whether or not they believe a proposed, the proposed conservatee needs to be conserved. And they're very good at their jobs for the most part. There are always exceptions. Um, they've been doing it a long time generally. They, they handle dozens and dozens of these conservatorships and they know what to look for. They're able to go out, they're able to realistically evaluate the proposed conservatee um, to determine whether or not they can make healthcare decisions for themselves, whether or not they can make financial decisions for themselves. And they will file a report with the court and that report will recommend whether or not um, a conservatorship is necessary. And the courts pay a lot of credence to what these individuals have to say. You know, they do receive pay, if they're court appointed counsel, and it's paid out of the proposed conservatorship's estate, but the rates are very low. Um, let's just say most people aren't working as court appointed counsel to make money doing it. Uh, they generally are just good people that want to help. And it's good. It's a very good safeguard to uh, may ensure that a proposed conservatee has independent counsel separate and apart from the counsel that's representing the proposed conservator because of the civil liberties that are being taken away if a conservatorship is actually necessary. And I'm going to move along here because I know I'm 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 waffling as I tend to do. Also, courts will appoint a probate investigator. These are court uh, employees that will go to um, the person's home. In addition to the court appointed counsel, they will um, you know, interview the proposed conservatee and determine whether or not they believe a conservatorship is necessary. And if one is, they will report back to the court. And if they believe one is not necessary, they will report back to the court. So there are important safeguards in place to ensure that people that are conserved, receive that care they need, and people that don't require conservatorship are not forced into one. Um, I said I would briefly discuss what an LPS conservatorship is. These are mental health conservatorships. Um, perhaps the best, you know, if I, for some reason, were placed on a 5150 hold, um, Welfare and Institutions Code 5150 at a, at a mental care facility, the person in charge of that facility would determine whether or not I needed a, um, an LPS conservatorship, which is a mental health conservatorship, because I could, be, I could be suffering from any number of disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. If that person determines that I need an LPS conservatorship, they will contact the County of Los Angeles or the County of Orange, uh, and the individual responsible in the counties will file the petition on my behalf to have me conserved under an LPS conservatorship. Um, it is a somewhat draconian conservatorship. Uh, you can be, the conservatee under an LPS conservatorship can be forced into a lockdown facility. You can force them to take their medications. Um, you know, it, it, it's a very serious and significant tool available to healthcare practitioners uh, for those treating patients with mental diseases. Uh, it, it's an, an area of, of um, law that I don't practice. Again, it's not a probate conservatorship. It's a welfare, it's under the Welfare and Institutions Code. Um, I only um, indicate it exists just for your edification. Um, if you want to learn more about an LPS conservatorship, there are lots of resources out there that can educate you further. So I want to open it up now. I want to learn, you know, what can we learn from Britney Spears? Um, you know, did the court go too far? Should Britney, you know, I, these are the things that people have said to me, you know, the court went too far. 
Um, you know, Britney should be allowed to spend money on whatever she wants to spend money on. You know, um, I hear that they're restricting her ability to make phone calls and receive text messages and they're mirroring her iPad. Um, they're, they're having a say over who she can date. Um, you know, they're controlling basically every aspect of her life. You know, Britney Spears was still performing in Las Vegas as, as a resident and she was making millions and millions of dollars for her estate, yet she wasn't, uh, you know, she wasn't basic. She wasn't receiving the benefits of all of that. And was that fair? It's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, practicing in this area of law, I understand why conservatorships exist. Um, and, you know, when you look at Britney Spears, she's what, she, this, she was conserved in 2008. I think she was quite young. I think she was probably in her mid twenties. Um, the issue with the Britney Spears conservatorship, which is uncommon, unlike a lot of just the run of the mill conservatorships for normal people is that the records are under seal. So I don't have access and you don't have access to what Britney's psyche valuations were. We don't know the types of medications she was under. We don't know if there are individuals in her life that were trying to unduly influence her to marry her, to give away her money. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult question to ask without all of the facts. Um, you know, was it necessary to control access, her access to her phone, to monitor her texts? Again, it's a, it's a difficult question to ask. Who was she in communications with? Were these people trying to do her harm? Again, we don't have the answers to those questions. So it's hard to, to kind of weigh in on what the judge's decisions were in a vacuum without all of the evidence. But, um, Based on what I read the transcript of her telephone call, she called into the court in June and spoke with Judge Penny and made a very impassioned plea um, uh, that the conservatorship had gone too far, that she was the subject of conservatorship abuse. Um, in my experience, generally someone that's conserved wouldn't have the capability to make that kind of argument before a judge, an impassioned argument like that before a judge. So, uh, you know, part of me thinks the conservatorship did go too far. Um, you know, I know that she is now engaged to be married. Um, I understand that was only, that's only a recent occurrence because there were controlling who she was able to date and who she was able to see and when she was able to see them. You know, I understand that um, you know, based on the documentaries I've seen that she was being prevented from spending money. She wanted to buy a pair of shoes that she saw in a shop window and she was told um, she couldn't do that. In my, I mean, based on conservatorships that I've handled in the past, uh, if the conservatee is sufficiently capable of making some decisions for themselves, you know, I'll ask the court to grant um, to an order a stipend, you know, it's a certain amount of money paid to the conservatee every month that would allow the conservatee to go out and spend that money on whatever they want. It's difficult to me for me to believe that there wasn't a stipend given to Britney Spears each month. But again, I don't I don't know the answers to that those questions. Um, but you know the Britney Spears what the Britney Spears conservatorship has done it's raised a lot of questions about transparency in the conservatorship system and should they be more open to public scrutiny? Um, generally, they are. And, you know, most of these conservatorship petitions, uh, unless they're confidential supplements or something like that, are, are public record. They're not filed under seal. So there, there is certain transparency, and the probate court ensures that all of the interested parties in the conservatorship, the relatives of, of a conservatee, are provided notice on everything. They're able to object to any actions that are being taken. So, you know, it's, it's again, I, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but it is difficult to um, you know, weigh in on whether Britney Spears was uh, wrongly taken advantage of without having all of the evidence. But again, as I said, it would seem to me that the, the conservatorship may have run its course, um, given her ability to 
make that impassioned plea to the judge. But, you know, we don't know, you know, if she is no longer concerned, will she stop taking her medication? Will she stop, will she not voluntarily go to therapy? You know, she, she has diagnosed mental illnesses she needs care for. Um, you know, if keeping the conservatorship in place, even if it's a limited conservatorship, will, um, you know, allow her to get the treatment she needs, then, you know, that's something I, I would hope the court would take into consideration to determining whether or not to terminate the conservatorship. Okay, I, I, I could go on forever um, talking about conservatorships, but I won't, uh, and I know I'm over time, but I would like to take some questions if any of you have any, you know, it could be about Britney Spears or just anything in regards to um, what a conservatorship is. If you have uh, any questions whatsoever, you can use the Q and A uh, button down below, or raise your hand, and uh, you could come on screen with us. Let's give you a couple of minutes. Hey, Stefan, I'm not seeing any questions okay. well, come through. My, my contact information. Um, I think. Oh, here, Irene. Irene has, she's oh. raising her hand. So let's see if we can invite Irene to come and talk to us. Go ahead, Irene. Hi. Um, my question is, is there anything in this role that would um, I mean, don't they go up for some kind of review so these cases can be reviewed more frequently if you're um, under this kind of conservatorship and everything else that is just automatically, let's say every two years. I mean, just like a sentence. I mean, when someone uh, goes to jail, they, um, you know, they can, I'm not sure what the terms are, but they can, you know, ask to have it revisited and appeal it, I guess would be the word. So sure. is there something in place that will, every two years, every three years that they go revisit these cases? Sure, well, one of the rights that a conservatee always maintains is the right to request that the conservatorship be terminated. So that's one of the, you know, Britney Spears was able to bring a petition to the court to terminate the conservatorship. Um, again, because of the, the significant, the taking away of such significant civil liberties of an individual. Again, the court appoints court appointed counsel and in, in, in Britney Spears case, this individual Sam Ingham was, has been her attorney since the inception of the, um, of the conservatorship, I believe in 2008. Um, and I believe he's only recently um, requested to be taken off the case. You know, that attorney's sole role is to ensure that the interests of the conservatee are, are followed, are taken, that the conservatee is taken care of. You know, it would be my hope that if a court appointed counsel saw any evidence of conservatorship abuse, that they would seek to have a conservator removed and replaced. Or if they believe that the conservatorship was no longer necessary, that the court appointed counsel would bring a petition to have the conservatorship terminated. Um, you know, frequently courts will also send probate investigators back out to re-interview uh, conservators, conservatees to um, determine whether or not they are still in need of uh, a conservatorship. So yeah, there are mechanisms that, that exist out there that would bring um, concerns to the court, you know, other than just in a annual or biannual accounting. Well, how often do they send the probate investigator out there? Is that just whenever there's a red flag or is that just on an, in a? Generally, um, it's, it is more um, on a red flag basis. Um, okay. Some courts may order that the probate investigator go out and speak to the conservatee once every six months, once every year, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's, there's a, there's no set standard, no set timeline to it. Um, 
you know, again, the, the court's going to not take for granted, but it's going to assume that if someone's petitioning the court to be appointed to a conservator and they have a fiduciary duties under the probate code and under the law to take care of the conservatee and provide for the conservatee, the court's going to assume they're going to do that unless they receive notice that that individual is not. Um, you know, there one would hope that family members of the proposed of the conservatee would bring matters to the court's attention if there was fear that the conservatee was being abused in any way. So there are mechanisms out there to bring these matters to the attention of the court, other than, like I said, just relying on the the annual or the biannual accounting. Thank you so much, Irene. Uh, we have another question here from Bridget, but Stefan, before we get there, yesterday when we were prepping, you you made a comment about something else you were surprised about, which was that Brittany early on wanted to hire her own attorney and the court denied that. And, you, and I, I recall you saying that that was a little odd. Yeah. Um, when Brittany Spears was first conserved, she wanted to retain a gentleman by the name of Adam Streisand. He's a, he's a very well-known, very good probate and trust litigator in LA. And the court found that she lacked the capacity to retain Adam Streisand as her counsel. Um, and instead, she she received she had Sam Ingham who was court appointed counsel. Now Sam Ingham would have been appointed regardless, but Brittany was denied the right to select counsel of her own, which I don't know the reasons why. I don't know what argument took place before the court, but I am. It shocks me. It shocked me a little bit when I first learned that. Because I currently, I represent a conservatee and I am not her court appointed counsel. I was retained by her when someone filed a petition to have her conserved. Um, it's a unique experience. She has a guardian ad litem appointed to her in another case. And the guardian ad litem sought to have my client conserved because she believed that it was necessary. She could no longer take uh, make decisions for herself financially or for her health care. This woman came and hired me um, independently of being appointed by the court. And we went to before the court and the court deemed that she had the right to retain me as her private counsel. The court determined that she had the capacity um, to retain my services. So I, I don't know, you know what happened in 2008. I don't know what what Britney Spears was experiencing. I don't know, you know, if her mental illness was such that she wasn't able to make that decision for herself, but I, I shared it with Jody yesterday. I found, when I found that out, I found it to be very shocking. And I believe it's, it's the, the courts, again, I don't know what happened, but I think the court overstepped in that circumstance. All right, so we have maybe time for just one more question. And I've also put Stefan's contact information in the, chat box in case you have other questions um, that were unable to answer live, feel free to reach out to him directly. So Bridget asks, so if a husband and wife have a power of attorney and an advanced health directive, the only thing we need to do is ensure that if the person listed is unable to assist their partner, then an alternate, then an alternate should also be listed in the event. Yes, that's that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, if so, uh, my power of attorney obviously would list my uh, my wife as um, someone to make the decisions for me financially or uh, re regarding to my health care. Should I become incapacitated for any reason? Uh, however, what if my wife and I are involved in the same accident and she also is in deemed incapacitated? She can't make decisions for me. So who's going to do it? Well, I'm going to name in my power of attorney or my advanced healthcare directive an alternate agent. I might even I'm probably going to name two or three people. Um, you know, in the event the my primary agent isn't isn't uh, doesn't have the capacity to act for me or they they don't want to act for me. You know, you can't force someone to act for you. You know, 
then we'll go to the next person on the list. And then if that, if that person doesn't want to, or they can't, then we'll go to the next person on the list. So yes, very good point. Very important to name in your power of attorney or your advanced health care directive successor agents in the event your primary uh, nominee uh, is unwilling or unable to act. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. This was a great presentation, a lot of information, important information about conservatorships and what we can learn from um, the Britney Spears case. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We will have a recording of this video up on our YouTube channel, on our website. And uh, if you'd like to receive a copy, go ahead and reach out to Stefan. Yeah. Thank you all very much. And Absolutely. we wish you. Go ahead, Stefan. Oh, I was just going to say, please feel free to, to email me directly. I, I, I could have talked for hours and and I know I talked longer than 45 minutes, but it's just such a, it's just such an interesting area of the law. So go ahead and email me if you have any specific questions. You're muted. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end our webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone.